Hey there, welcome to Blockhead, the podcast where cartoonists talk comics and just about everything else. My name is Jeff Grogan. I'm a cartoonist, animator, and illustrator, and for the next hour or so, I'll be your host in a series of conversations with comics creators about their lives, their work, and comics. So sit back and enjoy. Hey, Blockhead listeners, welcome to a new episode of the show. Hope the summer is going well for you wherever you are. Hope the weather is holding out and uh, and it's not the heat is not too extreme and that you're finding time to relax. And I hope today's episode will help you in that endeavor. Uh, we have with us today the wonderful Ruben Bowling, uh, cartoonist creator behind the wonderful, equally wonderful comic strip, Tom the Dancing Bug, which is really not just one comic strip, it's many comic strips within one package. And uh, if you've never seen it, man, you are missing, you are missing it. You've got to check it out. Uh, you can go to TomTheDancingBug.com. It's uh, social commentary, it's political commentary, yes, it's all those things, it's cultural commentary, but it's also just darn funny and hits me where I live in my funny bone. Uh, it's absurdist humor of the, the, the greatest uh, variety, I have to say. It, it really is terrific. I, I've been reading it for a long, long time and online and elsewhere and uh, before that. And I've always loved it. And so having Ruben here to talk about his work, to talk about the comic, uh, to talk about where it came from and how it got there and all of that, as well as a little bit of politics, not a lot, uh, because Tom the Dancing Bug does have a particular take on, on the political situation of any given period. And uh, so we talk about all that stuff, and it was just a wonderful conversation. I had a great time, and I hope you will as well. I hope that comes across in the interview. So uh, there's a lot of info, by the way. Uh, Ruben's got a brand new collection of Tom the Dancing Bug comics coming out. And I've got to tell you, the, these books are beautiful. They're, they're, I think they're printed by Clover Press. You can get them through Amazon. You can also get them at TomTheDancingBug.com, and I encourage you to go there. There's a brand new one coming out. It's the Great Storm, Tom the Dancing Bug. Um, but, it, you know, these books are, you think, when you think of cultural commentary, that it gets dated, you know. But I've got, I, I've been looking at uh, a variety of these books, and I've, uh, I, I'll have tell you, this stuff hasn't dated. It really hasn't. Um, it's it's still, and the absurdist humor is still there. So it, it don't ever worry about that. You pick up one of these books, and you're, you're going to, if you're like me, you're going to, you know, just laugh out loud. Uh, as you, people are going to wonder what what you're on while you're sitting there reading, because they're just hilarious. So I highly recommend them. You know, Tom the Dan collected Tom the Dancing Bug. I think there are seven volumes, and the eighth is coming out if it's not out already. And you can find it on Amazon. All this stuff will be in the show notes, and uh, be sure to to look there for more info. But okay, without further ado, why don't we just get to the interview? I'll talk to you at the end. Uh, I've, I've got some stuff I, I just want to chat about for fun, and uh, um, so let's just get to the interview now, okay? And uh, I hope you enjoy it. Ruben Bowling, <laughs> Ruben Bowling, <laughs> Ruben Bowling, and myself in conversation. I'll see you on the other side. Hey, Ruben Bowling, welcome to Blockhead. Hey, Jeff, thanks very much for having me. Glad oh, to be here. It is. I have to say, this is a highlight of of this show for me, uh, for a lot of reasons. One, I've been reading your strip for God knows how many years. It's just one of those strips that has been there for a long time, and I've encountered it in all kinds of places. And it's just, I take it for granted, actually, the fact that it's it's there and everywhere, and it's always popping up on my feed somewhere. Um, that's one thing. So, and I've always found it to be consistently one of the funniest things in the world i swear to god I, I mean the other day i was sitting in the dentist's office 
And uh, th there's all these people who are really tense and nervous and quiet and, you know, very dour looking in the dentist's office world sitting there. And I'm sitting there reading one of your books and I'm laughing my ass off. I mean, <laughs> out loud laughing oh. and I cannot contain myself. And all these people keep looking at me and <laughs> what is he on? Because we want some of that. <laughs> and a and a dentist laughing gas. Yeah, exactly. Oh man, thank you so much, Jeff. That means so much to me. I'm always so gratified to hear that, especially that you know you find it funny and that you've had it been you know following it for so long. I've been doing the comic strip for uh, 34 years, so yeah. it can be easy to take for granted because every ding dong week uh, there I am again. Uh, but yeah, it's a lot of work, uh, but it's been, you know, a joy in my life. And it's a, you know, especially a joy when I hear people like you say that, you know, you've been enjoying it and, and laughing at it and, um, and appreciating it. So that's, I, that's fantastic to hear. Well, yeah, all I can say is thank you <laughs> for, 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 uh, taking some horrific, uh, unthinkable situations and turning them into enormously funny uh loud, oh. loud riots man they are it's fantastic and uh, oh thanks so much yeah especially in the past few years it's oh been it's been a lot of um you know taking and it wasn't always this way i've been doing it for 34 years and when i started it was pretty much apolitical mm -hmm. uh but and then when it was political it was sort of you know sort of intellectually political or humorously political but yeah in the last few years it's been a lot about um pain that uh I've been feeling and a lot of people have been feeling and trying to turn it into into something. I don't know what, something funny or something cathartic or something inter interesting or entertaining, but there's a lot of pain behind it. You're right. Yeah. It, you know, I mean, well, one of the things I was going to ask you, I'm thinking of, oh, what, what kind of questions should I ask? You know, what witty questions should I ask? And the, the first one that came to my mind was, you know, what's funny about this political moment? about this summer 2024 i mean what do you find that's funny that you can put into uh, a comic strip or a number of comic strips such as it were within tom the dancing bug well i can't list hilarious things about what's going on in our political landscape uh it is uh i've had to sort of adjust what my goals are when i and and also the fact that I'm even commenting on it is something that, you know, I've had to adjust my goals to accommodate. Um, but yeah, I've had to sort of say, you know, it's not, things aren't always going to be hilarious. This is not a, um, a joyful party. There are times when I, I'm satisfied with doing something that's entertaining and interesting. Um, and then maybe that's the goal. Um, and then maybe while I'm developing an idea that I think might be entertaining and interesting, I'll come up with little funny asides. But uh, I don't know. You'll see I don't as as much less than other political cartoonists and commentators, I think I don't make fun of Donald, F Donald Trump and his foibles and his, uh, oh, he said he mispronounced this or he, uh, you know, I, I or, oh, he he loves mcdonald's or you know all the all the tropes or or whatever because i find him to be a very scary and dangerous figure so i sort of take um funny things on the on the outskirts um it's especially in this in the last few years after he's been out of office i've done a lot about his followers because i think uh maybe you know while he was in office it was a lot about trump and then while he's been out of office, um, which is the sort of the subject of my last book, the last the past for 2020 to 2023, mm -hmm. I sort of consciously, maybe consciously, but also I think this was just sort of natural, moved away from commenting on Donald Trump and more on on his followers, because that's sort of the more alarming aspect of it to me. I mean, he is a um a psychopathic narcissist uh and they're a dime a dozen uh he he may be there's there's many of them mm -hmm. uh the, the amazing thing is that he's got you know 30 percent 40 percent 45 percent hopefully not 51 percent mm -hmm. uh of the of the country um who 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 find him appealing and not only appealing but more so than any other politician um 
you know, in in the in maybe in American history, these are are people who are sort of, I would say, in the cult. But they themselves would say he is a a hero. He's the best president ever. He's he is. Uh, you know, how how can they look at that man and and find all those attributes? So I've been I've been focusing recently on that. Now, to answer, to go back to your question. That's not does doesn't make it any funnier. <laughs> that's right, right. Funny. Uh, right. So right. you know, I'm sort of talking myself into a circle that it certainly changed. But um, yeah, I try to. I think I I try to be find interesting takes, um, make them entertaining, and then along the way, uh, hopefully, I find something uh, funny in the margins that I can I can I can use. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, I don't find Donald Trump funny in the least. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and I would agree with you. I think he's he's a scary monster. Uh, no doubt about it. But it, it is it while he himself is, is not funny, you have found ways of of sort of taking the pomposity and the the well, the power of the figure. This is what great political cartooning does. It sort of, you know, deflates a figure who is larger than life and um turns him into something that we can laugh at even at the same time that we're afraid of him and one of the things that i find so gratifying about your stuff is when i'm reading it uh, so it's like it, you recognize wow somebody else gets this too not only do they do they understand what's happening but they're also you know they're they're may, humanizing it to the extent of maybe i don't have to be so afraid you know because there are people out there like ruben bowling making this comic that are um you know aware of and making insights that that i'm not seeing or that others might see but when they read the comic they may see them and so for me as a reader there's always at the same time there's great entertainment there's great solace in what you put out there too that's that's well, that's very nice to hear and that's that is gratifying and i think that that is sort of um my role when people ask do you think you know are you making a difference uh do your comics make a difference and the i think the answer is obviously no even if my comics were were a hundred times more popular than they are popularity aside uh my comics aren't gonna convince um anyone mm -hmm. uh so i don't make a difference in that sense i'm not changing anyone's mind uh but to the extent but then, you know, what people will say, and this, and maybe I could agree with this, that I make a difference in the sense that I'm, I'm comforting people who agree with me. Mm -hmm. If I'm not, you know, changing the minds of people who don't agree with me, um, I'm, you know, I'm letting them know that, you know, they're not alone. There's plenty of commentators who are anti-Trump. So it's not sure. as though I'm a, a lone voice in the, in the resistance, but maybe the way that I'm doing it, you know, uh, um, resonates with, with people in, in a, in a unique way and, and maybe, I'm adding a voice to that and and I'm just, you know, uh you know, just uh adding uh to the to the voices and the and the different ways of looking at Trump. I've I've analyzed Trump and the the um the Trump phenomenon and his followers, you know, every which way, um almost every week, probably 80% of the weeks for the last eight years. Uh so I've, you know, I've I've come upon so many different, you know angles and and takes on it uh thinking about it staring at a blank page trying to think how else can i you know say something else about this uh this this horror this monster uh so um so yeah i think uh you know i i i hope that you know all that work you know does does help people in 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 some way the the, the people who who may agree with me and find find some comfort in in you know a unique take or maybe agree with with what the person already believes or has thought about but i i depict it in a in a unique way um i hope so you know my goal is just to try to and my goal since i started the comic strip has always just to be um uh interesting entertaining and funny in any way that i can um and i got into politics just because that was another way that i could do it but you know, again, for the first at least half of the comic strip, it was almost apolitical, um, and I was just doing being as funny as I could about other things, about australopithecines and time travelers and and stuff like that. And I still, 
God, I love when I get to go back and and when I can, uh, when I can get my brain to think of other things and and go back and do something that's not political. I love those weeks. Oh. Uh, but yeah, just you know, whatever whatever I'm thinking about goes into that week's comic, and um, it's just that recently I've been thinking a lot about Donald mm -hmm. Trump and sure. politics. Sure. And I, and I think we all are right, because it's a really for those of us who are on a particular from a particular point of view, it is a very scary moment I mean, for anybody who's outside of the MAGA cult. It's got to seem precarious. Um, we, we just don't know what's going to happen in November. And we don't know even if, you know, uh, Kamala wins, say she does. Right. We don't know what's going to happen after that, because we've got a, a group of MAGA loyalists in the House. Right, and, right. Right. And they've got to certify the election. And who's going to who says that Mike Johnson is actually going to stand up right. and certify the election? Right. And then if it goes to the Supreme Court, there's there's nothing they won't stoop to. So uh, so right. it is it is uh, it is scary. You're totally you're totally right about that. And, you know, I guess we're recording this right after I guess it was just a few days ago that Biden dropped out and then Kamala quickly became the presumptive nominee. Um, I had a deadline and I, I thought, boy, should I, should I do something about that? And it, it was so, I had like hours. Mm -hmm. um, and then I realized I, I can't, I'm not that kind of cartoonist. I'm not a, I do a weekly comic strip. I right. can't respond to hour, the hourly, um, you know, developments. Um, it seems as though, in the Trump era, I mean, he changed everything. Yeah. He, he, it's, it's really just the phenomenon of my lifetime. He changed the, 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 the rhythm of, of our, of our public lives. It used to be weekly. A weekly comic strip was, was definitely timely enough. I would comment on what people were talking about that week um, if I was doing something political, and, and from the minute he came on the scene, it became an hourly and daily thing. He would do something, everyone's talking about it. And then I couldn't believe that like 18 hours later, everyone totally forgot about that thing that was on everyone's mind. And there was a new thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just the whole cycle just sped up so fast that I, you know, I can't keep up. I just realized from my a weekly comic ship, I can't keep up with, um, you know, with that. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I, I just went ahead with my, you know, the comic strip that I planned, even though I was drawing it on, on the Monday after, um, after mm -hmm. Biden dropped out and it was totally irrelevant to that. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's what I had. <laughs> You'll get to it next week. I mean, I think, yeah. right. When it is a weekly comic strip, I mean, the expectations are are somewhat different although the the world you know your work is being seen in now in the context it's being seen in now given the political commentary and all everybody does expect up to the minute stuff but there are plenty of cartoonists who do that you know when i look to your comics it's not for the same thing that i get from other political cartoonists who are doing a one panel. Right. i'm looking yeah for they, else. they have a hard job the ones that work for well the very few that still work for a daily newspaper Mm -hmm. uh you know they have to do it there's yeah. they don't they can't say i'm gonna i'm gonna uh take some take a week to to think about this uh the next day the comic their, their cartoon has to be on that and they have to do you know three a week it's it's all it's a really it's a very different job than mine and it's it's and it's really uh it's really hard i don't think i could i don't think i could do it um uh so uh, and you know they they have a different format that that mm -hmm. is easier to speak to to uh, more timely news developments. I have to think of a whole uh, you know premise and and satirical take on it, and then develop it and with you know with other with other jokes. You know it's it's just it's it's really it's really hard. But yeah, so may, I, I mean it'll it'll all it'll all come out um, over the over the weeks. Um, uh it's you know it's uh, i have to I, I have to give myself cut myself some slack as things just move are moving so fast uh yeah. Uh, yeah these days yeah it's interesting that you say that he changed everything in regard to them at least in regard to the media sphere but it also points out to how much the media actually determines you know the zeitgeist and the 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 cultural context i mean like we're surrounded 
by this media sphere. Even though I'm living in Binghamton, New York, I live in the country, the trees, birds, all over the place. We yeah. also simultaneously have this, you know, network of noise around us. Right. It's constantly around us, and and we're at, while our physical reality may be, in, you know, removed from it entirely. You know, our our intellectual conceptual reality is all tied into this media thing and right. Trump, it, you know and i i don't like to assign him any great gifts in, in some sense like the idea that he's some kind of media guru or genius or something I, I just don't buy into any of that stuff when it comes to trump but somehow or another he got away with because people let him get away with all of this stuff when he first came to office whether it was twitter or whatnot that he was doing that just like you said, radically altered that environment, that mental environment yeah. we inhabit. Yeah, I would, I would say, uh, I mean, I, I know you're saying about him, you know, do you want to attribute any genius to him? But I, I do think in a way he is a genius. He's not a conscious master manipulator. He's not mm -hmm. thinking, um, you know, eight chess moves ahead of his opponents and the media I think he he's he's just a um a, a genius at communication uh, you know a, a natural genius at at bullying he just knows he has an instinctive knowledge of how to uh bully uh his way into getting his way mm -hmm. um and uh I think the media and America had never seen anything like this Mm -hmm. And that's why he was the the you know sort of the the black swan he was from the minute he started. I I would like to say that he um, he changed the way that I do satire um, because when you know I used to take what a politician that I disagreed with would, would say or what their policy was and I would exaggerate it, mm -hmm. um, but. Trump is is almost he's better at it than I am than 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 I think all satirists are. He he's has the jump on us, uh, and so I what I end up doing is taking what he says and I take it literally. Mm -hmm. I take and I and then I I put it in a new context. That's why I've been doing a lot of like comics parodies. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have Donald Trump as um, as Calvin and Hobbes. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, so, but I would, when he when he's in that context, when he's acting as little Calvin, um, I'm almost saying exactly what he says. It's like when he, uh, if if George W. Bush said, uh, "I am against uh, more immigration. Uh, I think it's a bad for our country." Uh, I I might have exaggerated that mm -hmm. uh, by saying, by having him say all Mexicans are rapists. Mm -hmm. um, and that would have been my exaggeration. And then, you know, and then I would have come up with a premise about, you know, all the people, all the Mexicans who are working in our, uh, our farms and our yards and our homes are, are criminals and rapists. Uh, and that's what George W. Bush is afraid of. Um, but Bush, but Trump comes out and just says it. He does, So how do I exaggerate that? So I, I just sort of recontextualize it. Uh, and show how insane it is by putting it in different contexts. But it's a uh, it's a whole it was a whole new thing. It was um, I had to relearn what I do. Yeah, yeah. Well, and but I think you did it masterfully um, because, like, when I look at uh, you know little Donald and John, I think that's what it's called. Right? Yeah, little Donald um, and John instead yeah. of Calvin and Hobbes. Yeah, yeah. Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, by the way, who's John? Which uh, yeah, John so they. So the reason, you know, some of this stuff gets so it's gets the, the lore gets so complicated that it's I, I, I hope you, it still makes sense if you don't know where it all came from. But there is a backstory to my Donald and John comics, which are which are drawn in the uh, the style of Bill Watterson. Right. Um, and that is that uh, I was there was a morning, I guess, in 2000. It must have been 2016. Uh, when I was getting ready to do my comic in the morning, um, the night before it had been revealed that Trump, before he was a candidate, used to call up reporters um, pretending to be his own publicist. <laughs> 
And he would say, this is John Miller. Um, I'm Donald Trump's publicist. And uh, and then he would and there are recorded conversations where you hear it's it's Trump. We we all know what he sounds like. And and he doesn't even really try to hide his voice. It's just there he is saying it. And then, you know, know, he'd say things like, um, yeah, I'm just doing this publicity thing. And then I'm going to go on with my life after that. And 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 so um, that morning I had a script for my whole comic. And then I suddenly realized, oh, my God. An imaginary publicist that's calvin and hobbs yeah, yeah and uh and i i mean i had a 5 30 deadline and i somehow wrote the four comic strips and drew them before that before the uh my deadline it was one of the you know miracles of my career that i was able to pull it off that fast because i'm not i'm not fast at writing or drawing uh but i got this shot of adrenaline and uh and then that became uh, a recurring um, feature yeah. of Donald and John. So it's little Donald. He's a little kid. And uh, John is his sort of adult Trump um, imaginary publicist. And the two of them, you know, interact the way Calvin and Hobbes do. And they have their flights of, uh, you know, imaginary um, adventures um, that, you know, then go back to reality. Uh, mm-hmm. But that's been, uh, you know, a great, a great gift. In oh. fact, um, after I saw, after I did a couple of those, um, it was getting close to the election, and I uh, called uh, my friend Matt Bors, who is a great cartoonist and at the time was running a uh, a comics website, The Nib. Mm-hmm. Um, and I said, "Listen, I'll. What do you think of me doing a daily comic strip um, uh, until the election of of, of Donald and John?" And he was on board. And so for those, for that, whatever it was, month and a half, um, I did my, you know, the my weekly Tom Dancing Bug and a daily Donald and John. Uh, but there was just so much material. Everything that happened just fit right into the Calvin and Hobbes template. And I just, just plugged it in and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, and wrote itself it was yeah it's it was amazing so yeah. uh so yeah donald and john has been a been great i'm i'm dreading uh that this would ever come to the attention of uh bill waterson and the, and he would uh and he would object to it because uh i just revere him and uh and you know the minute he said stop i would i would stop and i've taken way too many liberties with this um so uh I'm 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 grateful, so grateful that uh, that hasn't happened, and well, I'm able to continue it. He's got to have seen it. I mean, he must have. Yeah, seen yeah. It, I think I think he has, and he uh, just has um, uh, graciously, thankfully ignored it. Um, you know, we're with the same uh, syndicate, mm-hmm. uh, so and you know, my boss is is you know his boss. Uh, so I, I I would think so. Um, I don't know how much he keeps up with mm, with stuff, yeah. you know, with comics. Uh, certainly, political comics. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think so. But anyway, I w- whether he's seen it or not, I'm glad he's. I haven't heard from him on that. I think he's uh, one of the great um, cartoonists, great artists of um, of of my life. Uh, so you know, I'm grateful that I continue to do it. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Well, I am too. <laughs> but you do it because it's hilarious, oh, and it's a joy to see. Actually, because it keeps Calvin and Hobbes alive. You know, I I teach uh, at a university, and the, and among the kids that I teach, you know, I asked them one day whether they knew Calvin and Hobbes. No, they didn't know it. Really? At all? No. Nope. Oh, that's they, interesting. They, um, they knew Peanuts because of TV specials, but they they don't really know the comic strip, and they certainly don't know Calvin and Hobbes. Yeah, which is bizarre. Well, he, you know, he he's it's a it's a conscious choice on his part not to do anything that would keep it, you know, and and I totally respect that to keep mm-hmm. it in the zeitgeist, and and you know, he he definitely, uh, you know, no, he does no merchandising no cartoons nothing you know so it's just the comics and the books i will say that when my kids uh my kids are now grown but when they were uh kids i there were certain um you know sort of trends uh, that i would see them you know carrying books to school all the all the kids at one time it was bone mm-hmm. um at one yeah. it was reina telgemeier mm-hmm. um 
certainly Harry Potter, everyone knew about that. Yeah. But Halpin and Hobbes was one of them. That, that, oh. that became like a, a, a thing That's among the kids. Know. But um, I guess, you know, not every kid. Right. Uh, are you kids maybe late 20s, early 30s? Uh, they are uh, early to mid 20s. Early to mid 20s. The kids, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. So it's not that far removed from the guys I teach. Um, you know, it's interesting. Well, it strikes me as I, as I was saying that, though, you know, one of the things that your comics depend upon is an informed readership. Uh, you know, they may, I mean, to somebody who's not informed politically or otherwise, I can see how at least the political stuff, not, you know, a lot of super fun pack comics may not require that they be politically informed, but, uh, you know, the other stuff though, a lot of it, the Trump stuff and, yeah. and you know, all of the political commentary in the faux ads and things like that, um, you know, require an informed readership. Do you ever find that that's an obstacle uh, to you know the growth of the strip or um do you ever get uh you know an editor saying you know you dumb this down or something like that <laughs> yeah i've i've never yeah it definitely it's definitely to my detriment uh, <laughs> but you know i do all kinds of stuff that, that, that i don't i don't really have an editor who could tell me anything um i just do i do my comic and send it in yeah uh, so i've never had someone say you know no this comic well has too limited appeal or uh mm -hmm. so it's always been uh you know it can be very uh esoteric um about politics about pop culture about um i always feel as though people may not get exactly what i'm talking about but they'll get the idea of it but mm -hmm. really you know you really want to get exactly what i'm talking about um so yeah it requires i i don't i don't make many concessions to uh, people who may not know what I'm talking about, again, either with politics or 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 anything, it's it can get um, obscure, um, and that is to my to my detriment. Um, my my relationship with my syndicate is that, you know, I built up the comic strip. I was self syndicated. Yes. So I had no editor. the The editors were at the newspapers that I would send the comic to, and. But, you know, they can either run it or not, but they don't they couldn't tell me what to do. So I just started drawing a comic strip and then sending it out to newspapers and then more and more newspapers. And then um, and then I got the attention of a syndicate um, really right at the right time when I really could no longer do the the business side of, of selling the comic strip to to um, to newspapers at the time. It was before you could email the comic strip um, mm. or send it by online. So I also was getting fed up with, I would literally got so many clients and I had literally have to stuff envelopes. Oh. I would do four comics every four weeks because I couldn't do it every week. And then I would, and then I would like lay, lay them out and then put four comics in with an invoice oh, and man. send them out to, I don't know, I think over a hundred clients. Um, and uh, that just became too much. So anyway, they, at, just at the, and that's my, you could tell how long ago this was. We've already revealed that my first uh, baby was about to be born, and I just could not, um, you know, spend the time on on the, the logistical and business aspect. So, so the 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 syndicate, it's now called Andrews McMeal Syndication, approached me about taking on that mm -hmm. for uh, for newspapers, um, and it was right at the right time. But I already had, you know over a hundred newspapers, including the Washington post. And, uh, I guess, no, I didn't have the village voice yet, but I had a number of daily newspapers, uh, star ledger, Atlanta journal constitution, um, a bunch of them. So, uh, a Toronto, uh, Globe and mail. Um, so I didn't have the normal syndicate relationship where they help you develop a comic strip and say, don't do that. Don't do this, do this, could do this one over. Mm -hmm. Um, I made a deal with them that, you know, I send it in and they can raise legal issues for me if there's a problem with, you know, libel or something. Uh, but that, you know, what I sent in is is what the comic is. So mm -hmm. so I've never really had an editor tell me, you know, don't do this. My Tom the Hansing bug, I'll just I just do it and then I, I press the button and it's and it's out. Hey, Jeff here, taking a moment to stretch and grab a quick refreshment and to tell you how you can become a contributor to this podcast by joining us at patreon.com slash Jeff Grogan. 
Naturally, production of this podcast is not without its costs. And by joining us at the paid level, you'll ensure that I'll be able to bring you great interviews and discussions with top-notch comics creators on a regular basis. So join us, won't you? That's patreon.com slash Jeff Grogan. Um, <laughs> they, they do. They have a great, uh, I have a great editor who can, will discuss stuff with me and especially do uh, copy editing and will catch uh, typos. Uh, but, you know, nothing, nothing uh, substantive. Um, I run into problems when I do like uh, freelance stuff. Like I've worked for a little bit with uh mad uh Mm -hmm. new york the new yorker for uh almost uh for a little over a year i did a bunch of comics for them Mm -hmm. and then they will say you know we don't want this we don't want that and it's really hard for me to to take you know (laughs) those that direction thankfully it wasn't much but you know i have to like argue for you know no i think that should go and that joke should go and it's it's a muscle that i don't that you know i don't use so it's 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 hard for me to even articulate uh why i think something is funny and should stay in or why it's relevant um but uh yeah that's the only time is when i do freelance the rare times i do freelance stuff and have to um uh you know deal with direction Mm -hmm. uh uh and and respond to it well, you know, this this raises another question, actually, uh, and, and that has to do with when you, you started. How is it that you kind of knew? I mean, were you, you were aware that you were you were just of an independent mind right from the beginning. So that rather than, you know, a lot of times when somebody comes up with a comic strip, the first thing they do after they've got six weeks is send it off to a syndicate. You know, this is back in the day. Sure. Uh, and and try to get it syndicated right from the start but you didn't go that route you were building up syndication on your own how did you how is it that you even conceived of such a thing you know yeah. to doing it on your own and and that you knew that that was really the best route for you to travel well i, I partly partly i was i was lucky and and i'll i'll explain that i i i did when i was in school i did a weekly comic strip that basically is Tom the Dancing Bug. Um, it was called Tom the Dancing Bug. It, it, it's it, it, it's it's exactly what I do now. Uh, uh, maybe I lean more on recurring characters and features than I did then. I, I don't want to ever repeat anything then. Um, but it was you know the sort of free form, large format, uh, multi panel, almost like a page. Mm-hmm. Um, and I sort of made that up because it was for a weekly uh, school newspaper. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's was sort of like, it's sort of fit for that. And my idea for it, and I think I, I think I would have articulated this. My idea for it was that I would be, it would be like mad magazine where a different feature every week, a different, but I would be the entire usual gang of idiots. Mm-hmm. I would, I would do this and I would do that in different styles. And, and so, you know, it'd be sort of like, it's like a magazine page. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just, I had never seen that and I, I just made it up. Um, then when I wanted to do it professionally, I did, I did try the route of, of syndicates. I tried a daily newspaper, a daily strip. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a, um, a Australopithecine character that I used to use a lot more than I do now. And he, it was going to be, uh, he was going to be the star of the daily comic strip. Um, it was going to be like a comedy adventure, uh, comic strip. Um, and I did the rounds. I sent it out to um, uh, syndicates and I got, you know, the the, the encouraging rejection letters, uh, particularly from the one that I ended up with, um, which was called Universal at the time. Um, so I think that, you know, I, I had I was rejected, but I was going to keep trying. I was going to try other things. But then I thought in the meantime, uh I heard about there was a new weekly comic weekly newspaper in New York called New York Perspectives. It was going to be like a uh, a competitor to the Village Voice, mm. um, and uh, I I uh, submitted uh, a comic strip to them that would be just like my school uh, comic strip, a weekly you know what Tom Dancing Bug is a large format weekly comic strip, 
and uh, and they accepted it. So I began doing that while I was trying to do the daily comic strip. And then I realized maybe this is what I'm better at. I was having more fun with it. It was it was uh, more interesting. Um, and uh, I was uh, and, and the reason I say I was lucky is because this little newspaper in New York, New York Perspectives, I didn't realize it, but it was part of like a national trend uh -huh. of alternative news weeklies starting up all over the country in the early 90s. I started Tom Nancy Bug in 1990. Mm -hmm. um, so with, you know, no foresight or no, you know, market analysis or anything like that, I happened to have uh, come upon a, a type of cartooning and a, a weekly comic strip that could be um, more controversial, much more controversial than any daily comic strip for a daily newspaper. Um, uh, that was exactly what all these newspapers that were sprouting up all over the country um, were looking for. Mm. Um, I think that the the market was uh, sort of created by Matt Groening mm -hmm. and Linda Barry. Sure. Um, I guess Pfeiffer before before them, but they went as these were growing. I think Groening and Barry were two of the cartoonists who sort of made it such that a newspaper, a, an alternative weekly newspaper, a new one, you know, in whatever in in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, needed a, needed comics like yeah. that. That was uh, that that wasn't necessarily the case. That wouldn't not, that wouldn't be necessarily what newspapers would need. But they were all sort of defined by they'll have alternative weekly comics. They have listings in the back. They have, you know, a, an advice column. They had all these features that they all had in common. And thankfully part of them was, um, you know, comics. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, so, so this weird format that I sort of invented um, when I was in school was the perfect thing. Uh, it also, you know, it also kind of fit my sense of humor better too, because it was not, gag style it was premise and sketch style mm -hmm. um and which is what i grew up with i mean i didn't love bob hope when i grew up i loved saturday night, saturday night live sure. um and and monty python mm -hmm. um and so you know a more developed uh uh type of thing was was really my style of, of humor so in so many ways i was just it doesn't happen often but thankfully it happened once at the most important time i was in the right place at the right time with exactly the right product that people were looking for. And it all came around to, to bite me in the ass when I, you know, staked my career on this. And then they all began um, going out of business in the, in the mid uh, 2000s and, and late 2000s. And then I, I lost all that, but, but yeah, for a while, a while it was fantastic. I would just, a new one would pop up or they, they need, they needed comics and I would, I would send them out. I, I was a terrible salesman, but um, somehow I, you know, they, I, I was selling it myself to these alternative papers. Then daily papers started getting interested because they, they felt the threat of alternative papers and, and my alternative weekly comic strip was somewhat palatable to daily newspapers, as opposed to some that may have, you know, uh, bluer material. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, that's when I started getting into a bunch of daily papers and there's like their weekend section. So it really, the um, the '90s was a you know a great period of growth, but I didn't I didn't know how to do it. Um, I made everything up as I went along. I I found out about alternative papers. I think I I called up the Association of Alternative News Weeklies and said I was interested in advertising. Could they send me a list of the of their um, of their members? Huh. And that's how <laughs> I got the list uh, of 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 papers to send to. Yeah. Um, I, I, was did things, I did. I did things like it, it was incredible. I, I there was going to be a, a convention of alternative news weeklies in Austin. This was really early, and so I just showed up. I'm just like here I am. I didn't like register. I just uh, I think I maybe I, I must have registered, but I just showed up and I put um, stapled uh, samples all over the hotel lobby, mm -hmm. um, and that was. I mean, there were no other cartoonists there. I was the only one who had the 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 audacity just to show up and uh i had newspapers like fighting you know in the same geographic city the area 
uh, fighting over who would get Tom the Dancing Bug. So uh, that was, uh, you know, a heady time. And, and I really was so lucky that I was, I was, you know, I, this weird thing that I made up uh, was there was a, a, a gr huge and growing market for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it just hits me whenever I'm talking to students or something. One of the things that's hard to impress upon anybody is that timing is so important, being in the oh. right place, the right time with the right thing. And that is l luck of the draw. But it also helps to have a, a product that is as wonderful and funny uh, as Tom the Dancing Bug always has. Oh, thank you. Consistently, it, it, like I said, laugh out loud, funny. But it's it, that was a wonderful time in alternative news weeklies. I remember it mostly as a as a reader, not as a, a cartoonist. I wasn't trying to do that, but uh, as a reader, I loved. You know, you'd go to one little city and you'd pick up one, you know, something somewhere, and you go someplace else, and there'd be another alternative weekly, and they all had different, uh, you know, agendas, different takes on things, but they were all wonderful in the sense that they were this wonderful alternative uh, to you know, what you what the mainstream media was funneling into our minds um every week and and uh you know a lot of times there were these crazy articles but then a lot of times there's some great reporting and i'd been reading the village voice for for years you know i mean back when i was a student a college student in the late 70s i was reading it then i loved it and um stan max real life funnies and you know sure Matt Groening and Linda Berry were there. Uh, and I, I'm not even sure. I think Pfeiffer might have still been doing it then. Sure, he was. He was there until Pfeiffer was there in The Voice. You know, he started so early um, yeah. with them. I don't think he was paid when he first started. No. But I, I think he kind of invented, and not that I was aware of it, when you know, when I, I had no idea who he was when I started. Sure. Um, but he, what, I think he invented what I do, the, yeah. the the large multi-panel wordy weekly um, uh, comic strip. It yep. didn't really exist until he did it. Then the Village Voice, as did others, they they picked up these other uh, cartoonists. There, I guess that was like the first wave was uh, Pfeiffer was fifties, but then Groening and and Barry and Stan Mack um, were in the eighties, um, and then in the nineties there was like another wave. A, a new wave as alternative papers really expanded. Yes, yeah. I'm sure it's for techno technological reasons that they were able to to suddenly be able to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, that whatever printing process, uh, I don't really understand it. Um, but then there was a new wave, and uh, and after I went to that first um, uh, convention, eventually the other cartoonists started going to the conventions, right. and then. And then I wouldn't sell anything at the conventions. It would just be because everyone knew who I was. Um, I, you know, it was a mature market. And uh, but the cartoonists and I would just have fun. It was like our own convention. We would go there and, um, you know, literally just just drink and pal around and, and explore the city together. Uh, you know, Tom Tomorrow and and Durf and, uh, you know, oh, yeah. all these all the all these guys. Um, there weren't weren't. Keith Knight, um, um, yeah. So we were just we would just uh, treat it like our own convention, and uh, you know, do the equivalent of throwing water balloons off the hotel roof, and uh, and <laughs> and and get in trouble, and 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 we were we were such, you know, such the idiots of the of the convention, because we weren't really part of the we weren't didn't work sure. for a newspaper. Um, they were all there, you know, to like, to 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 talk about you know the the you know, ways to um, increase readership and, and advertising. And we were just like these, these clowns who came ostensibly trying to sell our strip, but uh, basically just fooling around and, uh, and having fun. So that was great. And it really created great camaraderie among the, uh, among the, this group of cartoonists. That's great. Do you guys still get together every now and again? Uh... Uh, yeah. Yeah, we do. There was a, there was a great, um, a few years ago, there was a exhibit at the Society of Illustrators on oh. alternative weekly mm -hmm. uh, comics, and um, you know it was fantastic. It was like a it was like a reunion. We were all there, and uh, and uh, just great to see everyone. But I'm still in touch with you know with so many of them. I'm they're just old friends. They're just great friends. Uh, uh, Tom tomorrow. And uh, Peter Cooper and I get together and hang out, I don't know, every other week, maybe oh, wow. Great. in New York, maybe every month. Uh, uh, 
but yeah, we're we're just we pal around uh, Ward Sutton and Keith Knight. You know, we see each other Always. when we're in the same in the same area. I'm I'm not mentioning some, but yeah, just just it's a great uh, group, um, and it was great to meet them. You know, we we would pal around, but really it was amazing because we were such like-minded people. Um, it was really like, you know, like they say, like finding your tribe. We we all had, you know, we're we're very different in many ways, but we have a, a very similar um, sense of humor and and mindset, and we just got along so great. It was really fun. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, it's interesting too when you mentioned Tom Tomorrow, Ward Sutton. You mentioned Keith Knight uh i th i think about how they've all kind of incorporated political situations into their work in in different ways yeah. but all from you know what we would identify as a progressive perspective right um you know uh and and it's do you guys ever do you ever wonder about that or is it was it just kind of a natural thing or you know it was just part of the zeitgeist i think i think it was uh boy if there was a conservative cartoonist alternative cartoonist i don't i you know i don't think he would have uh made much headway mm. in in the market because alternative news weeklies right. generally had a liberal mindset mm -hmm. not always i know in new york city there was a paper called new york press right um that i was in in actually in briefly after the village voice canceled their comics um uh, but so uh, most of them, uh, I think, would not have wanted a, a stridently conservative mm -hmm. um, a cartoonist. But um, I don't know. I think uh, we're all progressive because we're all uh, smart, uh, caring people. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, it's interesting. Uh, so in the early two mid 2000s or so, um, the bottom falls out of that market. Right? Yeah. And, and um, you know, when was it that the Village Voice stopped publishing cartoons? I kind of remember that, um, but I don't remember when it was. Um, um, I think that would have been late 2000s, but mm. before 2010, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, but kind of later. I started there, I think, in 1999. In fact, I started... Um, that was my dream was to get into the village voice when, sure. I, when I started in 1990. Cause that's, that was like the gold standard. Sure. So I, I did try and I would have meetings with art directors and they'd call me in and then nothing ever happened. Uh, and then um, they began running my comic intermittently. They would run it, you know, once they'd run one or, or and one, one week, one at the time, it wasn't a regular thing. And the week that they, they eventually, uh, fired Pfeiffer. Um, I'm trying, let me see if I can remember. I think, you know, I think he had started at The Voice. I think he was paid nothing. Yeah. Um, but by the end, you know, he had justifiably gotten a, a, up to a, a nice salary. Sure. Um, because he was an integral part of the history of the, of the paper and had, you know, helped build it. Yeah, um, absolutely. And so, but... I guess new management came in and saw, you know, the, the, the line item, you know, we're paying this for a, a comic and we, we can, we can get a syndicated comic uh, for a, a tiny fraction of that. Uh, and so, you know, they were paying him a good salary. Mm -hmm. um, so they fired him. Um, and, you know, I wasn't for that, but it happened that the week that they fired him, my comic, it, it was happened to be run that week. And so it looked as though they hired me to replace him. Oh. Um, they had other, I was syndicated. So I was much less than what he, I didn't, wasn't on the salary. Uh, so it was much less, but he, they had other syndicated comics. They had um, graining for years and, and uh, you know, and Barry and, and what have you. Uh, so it, it looked bad. And I heard um, that Pfeiffer was trying to find out who was this Ruben Bowling guy who replaced me. And I felt, I felt awful. I've never talked to him about, about that um although i have i have met him uh since um but so yeah i uh um i 
my wife I lost my train of thought. We were talking about uh, uh, when they they ended. Cards yeah. So so then yeah. So then we're getting into the and then eventually they just uh, the the uh, they I think they got a new art director mm -hmm. and he just he just hired me for every week and I was in there for I don't know it, yeah probably almost ten years and the group that was in there that, at that time was just me and Tom Tomorrow and Ted Rawl and Ward Sutton mm -hmm. uh, and that was great that was and we would and he this art director ted keller would have like every other month or so like invite us out to dinner we would all and so that was you know we don't get much glamour in uh in the <laughs> cartooning field so going out you know for cocktails and dinner with the art director of the village voice and and palling around and slapping each other on the back was um was was really that was great fun and and you know I would always sort of like when we would be out and have, you know, laughing and having fun. And I would always think like, this is, um, this is something to remember that, you know, you're here, the, the village voice cartoon is something that I had, yeah. you know, wish that I could be part of. And, sure. and here I am right, right, you know, right there, uh, you know, doing it, you know, drawing my comic every week, being in the village voice among many other papers and then palling around with, you know, with the other guys, that's sort of the way I, I pictured it would be. There weren't weren't many things that you know the way you picture it, but that that kind of was. Yeah, that's amazing. But then, like I was saying, the bottom sort of falls out. How did you you know recover from that? And by that time, uh, if I recall what I read correctly, you were in like a hundred different papers or so, and then the bottom kind of falls out. And you, and of course, like everyone else who was syndicated at that time or in alternatives, whatnot in print media. Um, you had to reinvent yourself all over again. That must have been really daunting and scary at that point in your life. Oh, it really was. Uh, it, and it ha seemed to happen fast. And, you know, I would talk to my friends and we'd say, boy, things don't look good in the newspaper industry. Uh, but we, I kind of believe, well, but, it, you know, newspapers will still exist. It'll still be OK and just it'll be downsized. But, boy, it really happened fast that I began. I think I was as a weekly comic strip especially for daily newspapers i was very easy to cut because i took up a big a big place i wasn't between hagar the horrible and blondie right. i was on like a you know like a quarter page on a on a you know every friday in some section um and uh so it was a big hole um and you know it was i was i was right on the front lines and got cut quickly alternative papers that didn't cut me went out of business you know tons of them began you know dropping uh, downsizing uh and so it was uh, it was really bad i knew that you know maybe the web would be you know another way to do to do the comic strip and i was i had a great web client at the time um salon.com was a right. web magazine maybe the first web magazine mm -hmm. um and they included my comic on the web um you know from their first issue that was like one of their i think so i think i was one of their founding uh cartoonists so i always but you know i felt as though i realized you know my my web strategy can't be just to be in salon because they yeah. pay like a good newspaper but that you know i need hundreds of newspapers um and i wasn't you know probably 150 at my at the peak um i need many of these so as they began dropping, Salon wasn't enough. And eventually Salon ran into trouble and uh, they dropped the comics. Yeah. Uh, so I was really in the wilderness. The comic was, um, I, I, I really couldn't continue it. Um, I was still in newspapers. Um, I replaced Salon with a, a website called Boing Boing, which oh, yeah. I'm still with and is a fantastic client and so supportive uh, and great readership. And that's great. Um but again, it just wasn't enough uh, uh, the way it was, you know, in the in you know, say the year two thousand. Uh, so, I decided to uh, launch a um, a subscription service, mm -hmm. and uh, I would uh, I figured what I, I wanted to get, I didn't want just to get take money from people. I figured I have to give them value. So I thought, uh, what if I sent them every all the members of the subscription service, the comic every week before it's published. Mm -hmm. So they would get the first, the first look at it. 
And so, boy, I've said this so many times, it sounds, uh, I'm getting, I'm getting uh, embarrassed saying it, but uh, I didn't know, I had to make it up. There was no Patreon at the time. There was no Substack. I had to, I had to piece together how I was going to manage subscriptions and, and, uh, and the money and, and whose subscription laps and all that stuff. But I, I worked it out. Um, and uh, the day that I launched it, I thought, you know, what's going to happen? Maybe, will 10 people sign up? will um uh you know 15 <laughs> so and uh the day that i launched it i don't remember how many people signed up but i remember do remember that the day that i launched it it became the single biggest source of revenue i'd ever had in the comic strip mm -hmm. uh so that was uh it was one of the best days of my life because yeah. it was just like my I was I didn't know that people cared about the comic strip, that people would support it or or and or would want to get a comic a day early. Um, I remember people uh, helped me. Um, Boing Boing made a did an article about it. Um, I knew a little bit a guy named a comedian named John Hodgman. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked him if he would. Uh, because I don't know, he was he had a blog or something. I said, "Would you write something about the fact that I have a new subscription service?" And he went way beyond that. He wrote a whole a whole big thing about how you know sub, this direct support of artists is important and 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 my and my subscription service. So and just just that day was insane. It was just like my phone, as they say, was blowing up. It was just because every time I get a to this day, every time someone subscribes, I get a um. An, an email mm -hmm. and to this day every single one i like i'm well i'm so grateful i see it i see the person you know the name and the email address and i'm just you know i get a, a great feeling but that day it was just like pop 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 it just kept they just kept coming and uh it was it was fantastic and that 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 on that day the comic strip was saved That's... because then everything i do is is to get subscribers now, now, Boing Boing is a great client, and I I love being on there. But I'm not there really for the the fee, which is great that they pay to run the comic. My main thing is that's a way to get new subscribers, mm -hmm. and I'm on Daily Coast. It's fantastic that I'm on there. But every now, every strategy is about getting uh you know, getting other sources of revenue. But the main thing is uh subscribers because that is just. That's the thing. Those subscribers are my boss. They they are, they they own the comic strip, uh, <laughs> and so every week, I you know tr I try to think of ways to you know give more content, you know more information, more commentary, other comics, special things, exclusive things, because I, I've got to keep every single one of those people who is a subscriber, you know, delighted that they're that they're subscribers. Um, so. Uh, that saved it. And then and then it became easier. Then Patreon came along and then that became another way to do it because that's just turnkey. And so you can subscribe in the old way or Patreon and then Substack. And I just, you know, however people want to subscribe um, to get the comic every week, um, I'm there for it. That's fantastic. Do you have any idea how many subscribers you have total? Um, I do. I don't want to, I don't want to say exactly, uh, cool. but yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's fantastic. I'm not, you know, it's not millions. It's not, but it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it is, it is a, uh, you know, it's, it's enabled me to, to justify uh, doing the comic strip it, mm -hmm. financially, uh, which, you know, in 2011, I, I really could not. Uh, uh, it was, I wasn't making enough money to, to say, this is a, this is a viable venture. Man. Um, it's, it's now a viable venture because of these people. Was there a moment at that time when you thought, oh man, I'm going to have to get a job or I'm going to have well, to. Well, no, because, um, you know what, this is, well, here's no other topic. I've always had another job. Oh, wow. Holy moly. I've had, yeah, yes. This is, we've, yeah, we've danced around it, but yes, I've always, uh, had another job. Um, I've had. Uh, I don't now. I'm oh. now, uh, thankfully, because of the Inner Hive, this subscription service, uh, my publishing. I've done. I've published. Uh, this will be my eighth book in four right. years that that comes out coming in late um, August. And yeah, so I'm, 
I've because I have more time now, I don't have a day job. I I can have more time to, to build the comic strip. And I have so that it now is, you know, it's not only viable, it's a it's a living. Yeah. Um, but uh, for almost my whole career as a cartoonist, I've had, um, you know, substantial day jobs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I've worked in the uh, I've worked as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, that's I trained as a lawyer, worked as a lawyer worked in the financial field. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I got laid off from a halftime uh, job in the financial financial field at right at the start of, of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, they, there was like a, just like a, bam, everything's laid off. There's, here comes the pandemic. Um, and so I just focused on, you know, building the inner hive and, and started this whole publishing uh, uh, project. And, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've pretty much you know, made back some of that some of that money that now I can uh, only do this. Wow, that's that's amazing. And I think what's amazing about hearing it on the one one hand, it's it's eye opening, you know, to hear that somebody who is who I consider as successful as you are um, all along. You've had to have this day job, which is very, very different from when we're talking about, you know, the heyday of syndication and Charles Schultz and all that. Right, kind of right. Right. But but you don't have an easily merchandisable, you know, product. But having no. said that, um, no, I think, you know, it, well, it was it was hard. Uh, well, first of all, I I live in New York City. Right. Um, I'm raising three kids. Um, and uh, and so, you know, I may have been making a certain amount in cartooning, but it just wasn't enough to raise three kids in Manhattan. Yeah. I remember at you know I remember for years I would uh, come home from work, have you know have dinner with the kids. I was in charge of the baths, bathe the kids, put them to bed mm -hmm. on Thursday nights, and then I would draw the comic. That this was the plan: draw the comic all night Thursday night, um, and then go to work on Friday and keep my keep my head down. Make sure, hope that no one hope that nothing nothing big happened. Oh. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a, the way I drew was a Thursday all nighter because, um, I wanted to as little as possible to, to, to have the cartooning interfere with my, not only my job, but being a, a dad and a, and, and a husband. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was, I would draw, I would write when I could, and then I would draw overnight. I can't do that anymore. Now, yeah. some, somehow at like 11, even if I try to draw late. At eleven o'clock, my hand just goes over to the to the light and turns it off. I'm like, "What about that? What happened?" And I've, yeah, I, I find myself in bed. <laughs> I, I keep falling asleep, you know, uh, earlier in the evening than I, than I, than possible. <laughs> I felt for Biden the night of the debate because I'm like, "Man, I can't stay up past ten o'clock." <laughs> but but th th you know, that being said, I have to say my admiration for you is just skyrocketed because to, no. to you know, not only uh, obviously keep an enormously you know a fantastic comic strip going uh as long as you have and then also to have a day job and be a husband and a father all at the same time uh, is, is you know i don't know if people know how daunting a task that is because you know obviously it's like having a full-time second job because you're not always just drawing all the time you're writing all the time well that's it yeah i would write on the subway and uh you know i would find time i don't know i don't really looking back on it i don't really know how i did it I uh it was um it shows you know how driven i was to be a cartoonist that i would it, you know as all these things happen i i would not give it up um and uh so um yeah some uh, i i don't i really don't know how i did it but but uh i mean with my halftime job that was doable Mm -hmm. But, you know, at a certain point, I had a, a, a real substantial job mm -hmm. um, that was, you know, more than full time. Yeah. Um, and then tried to and then did this. And uh, so anyway, yeah, that's that's amazing. Working well, it out. Well, uh, you know, uh, I know I had another question in there, but one of the things that that uh, I'll just circle back to is, you know, um, the subscriber base puts you in touch with your readership and your fans in a way that perhaps working through a syndicate didn't always allow for 
um you know there's always kind of a there's the middleman right in between you and the right you were saying that you didn't really know if people loved the strip you know in 2011 you're waiting to find out that day you know how people felt about it and you know obviously fortunately you were surprised um gratefully surprised but at the same time i wonder now that you're you're more in touch with your readership is that a plus or a minus do you hear what kinds of things do you hear from that readership on a regular basis um do they you know are there people who read the strip who you know are coming from a very different place politically or um or are the, all those people you know not interested in your work and and I'm just curious as to what kind of responses you get from the readership on a regular basis. Yeah. I mean, from the inner hive, it's, it's almost all positive. I mean, there, there have been a, a few times when I will do a comic and then I'll get um, an angry letter from the inner hive and I'll be like, wow, this person, you know, loves my comic strip enough to, to pay me uh, to get it and to see it. And, and is that angry, uh, which is fine. You know, that's their prerogative. Um, uh, I think, let me think of the, the worst, the worst case was, yeah, the worst case of this was, uh, it wasn't even substantive. It was, you know, I, I try to write commentary, um, in each, I, I do write commentary for each, each comic. And so there was one comic that I didn't, I wasn't, didn't really love. And, you know, when I send it out to the inner hive, it's, it has gotten no response yet. So I'm at my most vulnerable and negative about it um and then usually you know there'll be some reaction then i feel better about it but at that moment that i hit send to the inner hive it's it's sort of like the i feel sort of negative about it um and there was one i was negative and i thought well you know maybe this would be an interesting thing to share with you know the inner hive um you know what my misgivings are about it so i said you know i don't think this one didn't really work because uh you know it didn't because of this and because of that and I don't think it's a really very good one. And I got an email from someone from the inner hive who said, uh, tell it to your wife. Don't tell it to us. If Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, and, and there were other responses that were, that were sort of negative. And I realized, all right, I'm never going to, I'm not going to say anything negative. That's, that's not something that, that they want to hear. Um, and I'm of course, there were people who didn't respond to who may have found it interesting, but it kind of, it kind of makes sense to me. I don't want it. I don't want to uh, hear, you know, the insecurity. It, he said something, tell your insecurities to your wife, not to, not to me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to hear artists that I admire, you know, before I see, you know, a stand-up special, them saying this one, this, <laughs> this may not be so good. Uh, you know, so I just feel like, all right, as, as with everything else, I, I pretend everything is, is fine every, that this is a good one and, and, or, or it is okay. And, uh, I just pretend. And often when I'm, when I think one is bad, um, it ends up being good anyway. What I always think of the one, uh, last year I did a comic that I definitely would have, if I, if this was allowed, I would have said to the inner hive, this one doesn't work. This is a bad one. It ended up being the most popular comic I did all year. Uh, so, um, and, you know, it was voted by the Inner Hive, the number one comic of the year. Wow. And, you know, by all, by, you know, by metrics on social media did the best. So, and I really thought, you know, I sent it out and I said to myself almost out loud, do better. Don't, don't do ones like this, do better comics. And then, so, you know, you don't, you don't know. What was the, I mean, not to get to this, well, I mean, I'm curious what your critique of the strip strip was. What was the issue that you were having? Was it the language? Was it the? It was. I, I did a. It was a comic called Generation Gaps, mm -hmm. and it was about. Oh, you see, the thing is, this is one of the reasons it was so complicated. It's hard to even describe, and that was okay. where I thought. I thought it's too complicated. No one's going to read this and understand it. But it was about how in the it had two families and one was in the uh, maybe early seventies and it was a young person yelling about politics to her father saying, you know, we should, everything is, everything is terrible. We need to tear it down. Basically mm -hmm. everything is, is awful. Mm -hmm. um, but, and then one in 2023 where it's the father talking to the daughter saying everything is like a Trumpist saying, 
everything is awful, we should tear it down. And so, and, and I made the analogy, you know, step by step, you know, what, what it is, and including, you know, the, the young person, say, in the 70s, uh, saying at least, at least Russia has a functioning society and, 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 uh, oh, wait, they, yeah, right. And then, you know, that was, that's what the old person would say in 2023, you know, defending Russia yeah, yeah. and the, and the counterpart rolling their eyes saying Russia. Um, so there was a, a number of analogies that I, yeah. that I went through and it was complicated, a lot of words, and there were, you know, balloons going in different directions. And, and, uh, and I just thought, man, this is, I just got too far up myself uh on this one and uh no one's gonna bother trying to figure this out um and then i got this wonderful reaction um uh, and you know the the criticism i still think is about val- it's valid because i i always have to be careful that my comics don't get too um complicated mm-hmm. or wordy or you know as as one of your questions indicated obscure you know about things that people may not know about uh, so I'm, I always have to be aware of that. And I thought in that case I failed, but somehow I think that the, the overall idea, which I did like, uh, sort of shown through the, uh, the, the drawbacks and people ended up liking it. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, but, but anyway, to, I, this was a long, uh, sidebar to your question, having, you know, a more direct relationship with readers, um, is something that I did not want when I started this, um, but it has been a fantastic uh, development for uh, my comic strip and for my life. The, everyone has been uh, so supportive in the inner hive and, you know, most comments everywhere. Mm-hmm. I don't think I'm, you know, a big enough cartoonist that I, I draw fire uh, from the right. Mm. They, they'd rather just ignore me than, than, than fight me. Uh, but, but I, I do get, I do get the, you know, the occasional, uh, the negative stuff from, from the right. I get, uh, angry letters, threatening letters I've gotten. Uh, but I don't think, I think less than most. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering about that because I, you know, I, sometimes I just stumble upon your strip without looking for it. And it's, it's just what, what it's just going by on the feed somewhere. It's on Facebook or something. And, and I just wonder, you know, that obscure MAGA, cultist you know coming across one right. of the clips or just somebody i would i would think because i'll tell you oh, a couple of weeks ago i just i put up an anti-trump post on facebook and uh it was just you know little thing and all of a sudden i got this guy trolling me you know mm. out of nowhere you know a, a real like mega persistently i uh, no you know but yeah it was enough that it was like, oh, this is disconcerting, you know. Yeah, it is. It's yeah. But so, yeah. you know, and and that was just a little post, you know. So yeah. it's just wonder for somebody who's doing something that is pub as public as yeah. what you're doing. Um, it's surprising that you don't receive more hate mail. And well, I'm, I do. I don't get. Yeah, I wouldn't call it. I don't get hate mail. I'm not too rare that someone will will email me or something. Um, I used to get actual. I used to get uh, snail mail. I used to get actual envelopes that would be, wow. you know, mm-hmm. to the syndicate that's forwards to me. And then I strongly object to, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but you know, the comments, I just don't really read much of the comments. It, it's there. The, I find that, and you know, obviously the more, when, when a comic strip becomes more popular mm-hmm. and therefore, you know, goes outside further and further outside the bubble that, that I'm in, uh, it will get more negative responses, and you know, you know the the funniest is when someone will say the the left doesn't know how to meme. Like I do this comic strip, and they, they call it a meme, uh, and that's that that actually gets me because that's uh, it's not a meme. It's not a meme. It's <laughs> no. a comic strip. Jeez. Um, so so yeah, that that actually they if 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 you want to know how to hurt me, that's it. Did, yeah. did, don't call disagree, it disagree with me call me a, a libtard but don't say i don't know how to meme <laughs> <laughs> did you know i may be a podcast host by day but by night i don cape and cowl and with ipad pencil in hand draw my butt off on all kinds of comics projects and art and you can check out my work my handiwork and even buy it at etsy.com slash shop slash comics print works 
That's Etsy.com slash shop slash Comics Print Works. Okay, I don't really wear cape and cowl while I'm drawing, but you get the idea. That's Etsy.com slash shop slash Comics Print Works. And now, back to the show. So, uh, you know, I'm wondering, again, there are a number of questions that I've been running through my head as we talk, and I lose most of them along the way. But one of the more consistent ones is how do you how are you working these days? Are you working digitally? Are you working traditionally? Uh, and um, yeah, I, I've, I'm one of the last holdouts that I still use uh, pen and paper. Oh, wow. um, but it's but it's a combination. Um, there are some comics I do that are all um, on the computer. Very very rarely. Uh, but usually what I do is I draw with the idea that I'm going to be scanning it in and manipulating it mm -hmm. so there are very few comics where the original looks like anything like the the mm -hmm. finished product mm -hmm. um you know for super fun pack comics for example oh i should explain they're they're like um little a, a series of little daily comic strips that are like yeah. parodies or surreal um uh 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 manifestations of it. Yeah, they're uh, comic strips you would never see in the newspaper, which is exactly yeah. what makes them so much fun. They're I mean, they're so weird and so much fun for me to do. I love oh my God. I love doing them. But the way I'll draw them, you know, I, I will draw, you know, a character and know that I'm going to um draw them once instead of the three panels, instead of three times. Mm -hmm. Um and then I'll change it online, I'll change his expression or his mouth or or you know. So um and that, and that and that works because then it looks like a daily comic strip because that's mm -hmm. I don't know if that's how they do it but they their goal is to make it often to make it look as identical as as Sometimes. as possible of course mm -hmm. the, uh, over the three panels yeah. so I just use the computer to to, sure. to help with that uh, and uh, yeah so um, it's a it's a combination um, and you know and whereas before you know in the early days when I would everything was drawn I would. I take the original and Xerox it mm -hmm. um, and send it out to clients. Uh, so I would use whiteout, you know, to if I made a mistake and, you know, and, sure. and and I would print things out and then paste them on if it was, you know, like a title or something. Uh, now I, um, you know, if I make a mistake, I just make a note. I just draw mm -hmm. uh, on the side of it, you know fix finger in panel three uh, so that way no because the finger that didn't work so uh so yeah I, when i'm inking when i'm drawing it when i'm penciling i'm, I'm erasing constantly I'm, I'm really slow i am a uh i am not a natural cartoonist um i see you know friends draw and they just do it so fluidly quickly and confidently um you know they start in the left and move to the right and it's just everything is just there it's as though they're tracing um and everything is a every figure. Everything is a struggle for me. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I am I am slow, uh, and so. But that deliberation in drawing um, suits the comic strips pacing perfectly. I mean, th I mean, you think about this. Sometimes the, a sense of humor in co comics, as much as stand up comedian comedy, et cetera, is based is a lot of timing. You know, timing and rhythm have a lot to do with it. And your your comics are they are slow and deliberative. They're meant to be read. Even the even the super fun pack comics, uh, you sense that you don't want to just scan the sentences. You want to read the sentences, and the artwork suits that. You know, it's it's not like when I look at Keith Knight's stuff. Keith Knight's ink line is very fluid and very fast yeah and it encourages you to read fast and that's yeah. not the case with yours so he, he looks say, almost improvisational i mean i i know yeah. it's not the case but it, it looks as though mm -hmm. he just drew it you yeah. know yeah just just dashed it off but, yep. uh, out of but, uh and he is faster than i am but he uh yeah that's that's something that's right he has a a more casual mm -hmm. uh approach i'm usually um trying to evoke a, a style i'm not even sure what my my own style is i'm usually trying i'm usually if i have an idea i think of what style i want to do it in mm -hmm. um, and then i try to copy it and that's can be painstaking um yes sure so yeah it's it's slow i yeah i hope it doesn't slow 
people down. And uh, certainly on the super fun pack, there are times when, yeah, I think it, they're so silly. Some of them are just, you, you know, the only way that they would work is if you, you know, I, I often, I do, when, when I do a weekly super fun pack comic, I do five uh, daily comic strips on the left and then sometimes three panels on the right. So it's, it's all dense. And the whole idea of it is nothing matters. You just quickly go, if, if that makes no sense, no problem. There's something right below it. Mm -hmm. And so it has kind of a, um, a really quick uh, uh, feel to them. And I feel as though um, at one point, my, uh, my syndicate said, why don't we run these as actual daily comic strips, mm. chop them up into daily comic strips. And so it's run on gocomics.com, which is their, their website. And I think the biggest comics uh, site mm. in, in the world, Tom and Essingbug runs there every week, but there's another site called super fun pack comics where you can read the individual ones every day. There's a new individual one. Okay. And, and I feel as though they don't work as well because uh, there's something about the fact that there's there's a lot of them together that just has that feeling of just like it doesn't nothing they're so silly it doesn't it doesn't matter you just go on to the next one that makes no sense okay what's next um, yeah. and and it, and there's also a cumulative sort of like silliness that you sort of get into the rhythm of so that you know and I'll and I'll actually pace them out so that you know the last one will only kind of work if you're it got into a silly mood from the first, you know, four. Uh, so doing them separately, um, I feel as though some of the effectiveness is drained out of them uh, as opposed to when they're, you know, all together in one, in one weekly package. Oh yeah. Uh, I totally agree. I, yeah. I absolutely love them as a, a, a faux comics page, you know, super yes, fun. As a page. I just, yeah. I absolutely love that because it, it does call to mind the newspaper and it does call to mind, you know, that um, idea of the daily comics page. And these are what, what's just so great is that these are comics you would never in a million years oh, find any syndicate worth its salt syndicating. I mean, they're, it, I mean they're insane. meanwhile, meanwhile, there it is on the gocomics.com page, the, the page of uh, Andrews and McNeil Mail syndication, the biggest syndicate in the world. Yeah. Uh, but so, they're so uh, funny. So it's so it's very it's very silly. I'm I'm writing one now, uh, and uh, it's so interesting because when I tr draw my usual comic strip, I'm trying to think as intelligently as I can, mm -hmm. you know, to draw analogies or whatever, and and to be and to be funny in an intelligent way. And then when I do a a super fun pack comics, I'm trying to think as dumb as I can. I try to make myself as stupid. <laughs> as i can and it takes a while to get into like a fugue state where like you're just so you're thinking so stupidly that like the the silliest dumbest things uh come out and you think is that even a joke is that even a thing and right. like, well, get it in there <laughs> you know i had um bill griffith on the show not too long ago yes great. Uh, and bill griffith of course does zippy the pinhead among other things and we were we, he was on the show to talk about nancy but because uh, they did a whole thing out at the Billy Ireland Museum. Yes. But as we started talking about it, one of the things I love about Zippy, and this is after I heard a critique of Zippy on another podcast that I vehemently disagreed with. And and um, Zippy, it, one of the things about it is the rhythm of the language. And as I was talking yeah. to Bill, I said, you know, one of the things I love about Zippy is the way that the language works. It You can sense you write this comic almost like poetry and, and, you know, you go the, the absurdity of it and the humor of it comes out in the rhythm of the language and the way the words flow together. He said, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. And yeah. I was like, that's, I'm so glad because that's exactly what I enjoy about the strip. <laughs> but, oh, and this yeah. is true of, of like super fun pack comics too. When I'm reading, it's absurd in the same way that Zippy is, although it's not recurring characters, but some of them are, you know, oh, the, sure. yeah. the irrelevant head of crazy predictions or whatever the hell his name <laughs> or, you know, um, this, I just opened the book here. Horatio R. Bordeaux, crime solving bacterium. I mean, what, what the hell? <laughs> It's so saying that's hilarious. So ridiculous. It's it's great. And and boy, it's true. I mean, he does, you know, non sequitur humor. Yeah. Um he's and uh that's kind of what super fun pack comics is. Yeah. He was he was hugely influential to me. I I was trying to draw before I even submitted my 
first comic strip to my school newspaper. I I tr tried in college to be a cartoonist and I tried to be like Doonesbury mm -hmm. and I was bad at it. I was, <laughs> I was, it was, they were really bad. They were rejected and deservedly so. Um, and I discovered uh, his book, Are We Having Fun Yet? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it was like a revelation. It It showed me what cartooning could be that cartooning could have different styles of humor it wasn't i mean i grew up on peanuts and you know doonesbury and all that kind of stuff and 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 mad which is which is more like my sense of humor but really uh zippy was so outrageous and so it was non sequiturs but it was also so full of ideas mm -hmm. every page it was so uh weird and smart um i was just blown away by it and I think it really unlocked something in me um, that allowed me to find my own voice mm -hmm. instead of aping other people. And I took someone, you know, I, but I wasn't aping Z Zippy the way I no. was aping a Doonesbury. It, Zippy just showed me that I could use sen my sense of humor, let's say, that I use with my friends, being, you know, goofy with my friends uh, mm -hmm. in my comic strip. And it was more natural. It was more natural to me uh, than... You know, trying to fit into a template that you know I really, I really didn't, uh, didn't have facility with. Uh, so, are we having fun yet? Is was critical to me. Uh, and then, you know, then I submitted the comic strip to the school paper, and it was, um, you know, it was exactly my. There was my voice. Mm -hmm. I, for the first time, I found my comedic, my my cartooning voice. Um, not right an away. easy thing to do, man. It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, you can go through a whole life looking for that voice. Uh, that's that's exactly right. Um, and I was lucky because I don't think I would have had the stamina or, and persistence to keep looking for it. But luckily, um, it happened to me like it happened to me like lightning striking. Mm -hmm. um, suddenly, there was Tom the Dancing Bug. Um, exactly what I'm doing today. Um, because you know i because there was an ad for the for a cartoonist they needed a cartoonist in the school paper and i sat down and wrote it and put pencil to paper and there and there it was mm -hmm. um uh whereas before in my half-hearted non-persistent way i had i had failed uh as a cartoonist i suddenly on on my own terms succeeded mm -hmm. uh so it was it was fantastic yeah so and then that's you know a lot of because of because of zippy oh that's great I, I actually if i have him back i meant to have him back on the show if I, i'll tell him that if i see i've, him. I've actually i i was lucky enough to have the opportunity to, to oh you to did tell, tell him, him that. great yeah, yeah i told him i don't know if he really you know believes that that's you yeah. know that you know he probably hears all the time you were so so influential to me uh you know but uh in my case um I can't stress enough. Yeah, it was it, it oh, unlocked something in me. Have you read any of his graphic novels? I, I, I yeah, I did. I, I well, the the new uh, one on uh, uh, Bernie Bushmiller, Nancy Bushmiller, yeah, uh, was a fantastic. A, yeah, a, it was great. Sort of force. So, it's it's great and it's heartening for me as a uh, as an aging gentleman to see someone you know yeah. ahead of me doing new vibrant work. Um, uh, outside of what he'd done before, um, yeah. uh, it's it's Takes really him inspiring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all a new, a t try something new and and yeah. succeed, you know, fantastically at it. It's a, it's very it's very inspiring. Yeah, it is. It is. I I, I have to say, I find it is also where you and I are roughly the same age, um, and I find it inspiring too to look at what he's doing and and see. Wow, you know, you can be eighty. And you know Biden, notwithstanding, but you can be eighty and um, <laughs> and and still you know be doing great work creatively, doing the, your right. best work creatively, and great work and new work, do, and work, new that, work. that's different yeah. different from what you've done before. In new directions. Yep. Completely. Uh, so that is uh, it's great. I've always got to watch myself to like not get too. I mean, there may be critics who would laugh at me saying this, but not to get too repetitive. Uh, because you know, I can find a, a format like Donald and John. Have I done too many of them? You know, I'm sure people could say I have. Um, I still find as though there's there's new stuff that I 
to find there. But yeah, to try to find new formats, to find new things, new directions for uh, Time Dancing Bug. Um, Super Fun Pack Comics was a, I did it a long time ago, but that was a great thing for me because mm -hmm. it was, I had done nothing like that. Um, and, you know, oh, and then, brilliant. you know, it opened up, you know, I've done 160 of them now. That's fantastic. Uh, so, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, and actually, I'm just, I should hold this up in case we do put this out there. Where is it? It's, oh, it's, I think it's your last book before it's not showing up. It's this stupid screen thing on Zoom. <laughs> Um, but this is Into the Trump verse. This is your last book before your new one comes out, which is on August 26th, right? And that is um what's that it's, one called? Uh the new one, the new one actually comes out. The new one's coming out like any day. Uh, oh, cool. Um, I should be getting my copies, I hope, later this week. Um, okay. um and then I can start. I sign them and send them out to uh uh to readers, sign them, sketching them. Oh, so awesome. I, I've got a big job. I got a big job ahead of me. And, uh, I've done it for all my other books, and uh, it is—it's a lot of work. It's a full-time job are, for for uh, a, 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 a weeks. Um, are, um, so beautiful books, by the way. They, I mean, they it, do a great job. Clover's done great. Oh. They they came to me with the idea of doing uh, the complete Tom the Dancing Bug, uh -huh. uh, and so we've done. This is uh, the sixth volume that we've done. Okay. We started with volume seven because that was when our first one was about Trump. Uh huh. Um, and then we began working backwards to earlier in time. Uh huh. Uh, but now I have four years of of new ones since that first Trump came out. So now we're doing one uh, based on twenty to twenty three, and uh, so it's yeah, it's based on um, the most recent comics. Uh, called it's the great storm tom the dancing bug okay. and i can't wait to get those uh those books they do such a wonderful job uh publishing them yeah. uh i could tell we, we were gonna get along when they came you know came to me with this idea and i was like well you know because i actually collect some of these you know um series like you know they i do i collect the Fantagraphics Carl Barks Library. Oh, great! And so I, you know, so I I know what it's like the mindset of a collector, and I feel as though that's part of 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 you know the market for this. So I was, and also you know for my for myself, I was so excited about this. I was like, well, you know, the spine has to match up, and we're going to do this with a we'll put a character in the top, and everything has to match up every time. And they're like, oh yeah, absolutely, yeah, we we get it totally because a lot of publishers do this, and they and they change the format yeah. in the middle. So you have volumes like one through three looks like this and then four and five look like that. And, uh, yeah. but, you know, I really wanted, you know, everything to have a, a consistent look and they, they've just done a really good job of that. Yeah. I, I, the books are beautiful and, and they, they're laid out beautiful, beautifully. Um, the, the graphics are great. It's if for people who, you know, who, who might not know how they translate into print, they, they're, they, they're just beautiful. And, uh, what's great is not only the way the cartoons are laid out, but also, you know, your faux ads and all, all look fantastic in here. Just graphically, it's a beautiful, they're beautiful collections. Oh, and, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, that's, absolutely. I'm really, I'm so excited to see this one. and so excited that, you know, we've done six complete ones, six, uh, you know, chronological ones, and then, and two others. Uh, so, you know, it comes out to, we've done eight books. Books as I've said, in the last four years. That's great. Uh, and so that's, it's really exciting for me. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's great to see this stuff in print. I didn't know that this was going to, this was a real, a real surprise to me. Um, and, you know, I was also so glad that um, in this, what I do, I, I make it to complete everything I've done. So if I do freelance stuff in a time period, mm -hmm. I put the freelance stuff in that, in that volume. That's so great. it really is like the complete Ruben Bowling um uh more than uh Tom the Dancing Bug. So in the latest one, I have a uh, a three-page comic I did for uh Weird Al Yankovic's um graphic novel oh, where I illustrate one of his songs. Oh cool. Uh, and that was a great process. Um and I'm glad, you know, it's really cool that I get to include that, you know, in this latest book. Oh, that's fantastic. It's great. And that, that's wonderful that it brings all this stuff together. Um do they are are they you know when you work with them are they like taking your file and using it verbatim or do they do some touch-up work do they do recoloring i mean the colors in this are are spectacular it's just printed up beautifully 
Um, but I'm assuming you're doing coloring for, you know, for the web. So um, it's probably RGB versus CMYK. And I'm just wondering. I think, I think Jeff, I think you're right. I think that's the only, uh, that's the only correction that's made. The, the color. RGB to, to CMYK. And then, but other than that, this, these comics are, unless they're doing stuff behind the scenes that I don't know about, I just send them the files, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, uh, and they, you know, lay them out. I, you know, I, I want to, I give the, the dates so that every comic has the, the, the week yeah. that it, that it appeared because so that it has, you know, that context, which is especially important, you know, in this book, because, you know, yeah. in, in 2020, uh, you know, every, every month had a different feel uh, from March to April to May to June. Uh, and so it's important to, to see that. Uh, so, yeah, it's, I, I feel as though, you know, it's great to just have like a, this is a full chronicle of, uh, of Tom the Dancing Bug and, and my work. Um, and I want to make it as, and, you know, they, they were fully on board with this, you know, make it as, as complete as, as possible. So the new book, takes us from 2020 from from january 2020 so right. it takes us through the traje trajectory from the the attack on the capitol on january 6th to uh 2023 right so um well it goes to the, it's the pandemic, mm -hmm, pandemic to the election mm -hmm. to the attack on the capitol which i did you know a lot of mm -hmm. and then the biden years and uh and you know MAGA, the MAGA nation's uh, response to it, um, and yeah, so it's uh, up up till yeah up through the end of through December twenty three. Um, right. So know, we have the end of the Trump administration through, um, through pretty close to where we are now. You know, pretty almost, close. Yes, close yes. Right. You know, you have the the uh, indictments. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's got it's got it all there. So I'm I'm paging through it and I see generation gaps that complicated comic. <laughs> oh, is that, that's, <laughs> that's, all, yeah. that's all the colors. Um but yeah, it's even got you know, let's see. Well, I can see there's the yeah. Kiev conspiracy and you know, a whole pile of other things, you know, dealing with uh Ukraine and whatnot. Um I love some of this. So, you know, among the strips that I also love are like the Lucky Duck, Lucky Ducky strips, which are a commentary on our, you know, economic stratification. Right, uh, right. Yeah. I, I love because that's not dependent on any particular political personage. It's all it's really just an examination and a very point, pointed examination of of the disparity in wealth that's accumulated over the last 50 years. Right, um, right. It start, that actually started with, again, you know, sometimes the, the, my opponents are better at better at it than I am. They uh, It started with a, a Wall Street Journal editorial. Um, geez, what year was that? I don't know. Uh, th that said, um, pe people who are too poor yeah. to pay taxes are lucky duckies. Um, and, and, you know, and therefore don't have a stake in 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 our in our uh, country's, um, you know, future. I, I forget what their point was, but they called oh. they, they, the title of the editorial was Lucky Duckies. So, you know, that's where like, oh, my God, that's that's the same thing as the Don, Donald and John thing. I said, oh, my God, that's like a Carl Barks uh, comic. <laughs> I could do uh, uh, and I have instead of Scrooge, I have a um, a character Hollingsworth Hound. Yes. It's always angry because Lucky Ducky, who's poor, always in his in his view wins. Right. Uh, and so every. There's like the same format. At the end, Lucky Ducky says, "Gotcha." He something horrible happened to him, but Lucky Hollingsworth Hound is furious that Lucky Ducky got away with something, and he says, "Gotcha." He's gonna end up. He's gonna end up sleeping indoors, and he's sleeping in. Lucky Ducky is sleeping in a hospital bed in a in induced coma because he's got COVID. <laughs> right, and, right. You know, Hollingsworth well, Hound is like, ah, you know, pissed off because he's sleeping indoors. You know, I mean. It ended up being a, a fantastic format for me because it, it's a it's a fun way to talk about some stuff that could be maybe too dry otherwise you know mm -hmm. a lot of tax policy and and income inequality and uh 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 and you know that could you say the stratification of our of our society which is which i think is 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 behind um all of our ills i yeah. think our, our uh, income inequality yeah. is 
is is the issue in America that drives all the other issues. Yes. Um, and so that's become a great way to comment on that. You know, using cute, funny animals, they get to draw, you know, Lucky Ducky and, and uh, Hollingsworth Hound gets, get to draw them angry at the end of each one. It's great. And it, what it does is it cuts through the bullshit, you know, I mean, it really does. I mean, there is so much invested in our, again, media sphere in order to confuse us or to make us believe in something that we're not seeing with our own eyes. And so, you know, there, there are so many people like who will vote against their own economic interests. They'll right. continue to vote for a party that drives up the deficit with tax cuts that support billionaires. And yet somehow they're convinced that these people are are fighting for them. Well, what happens in Lucky Ducky is it's pretty clear what's motivating Holl uh, Hollingsworth Hound and right. the billionaire class. And it's to, and, you know, so it cuts through the BS of all of that stuff and says, yes, this is what you're seeing. You know, believe it. <laughs> right. You know, well, again, like like you said, it's it's, you know, it comforts people who are seeing this <laughs> and saying, I can't believe this is going on. And so I just. I just play with it and have, you know, ducks and dogs doing it. Uh, but, yeah. you know, but it's, it's so, it's so important. Uh, it's not going to change anyone's mind, uh, no. but, but it's gonna, it's, you know, it's, I'm dealing, I'm dealing with these issues myself and, you know, and, and working through them. Um, a lot of times drawing this stuff is very cathartic because I get angry and then I get to express my anger through drawing Carl Barks animals. <laughs> <laughs> which is a fun day <laughs> yeah it, absolutely it's a lot of fun to do that and and to take your anger out in in such a way that uh you know makes the point and also makes us laugh as well which is you know just what you do all the way through you know this wonderful wonderful comic strip which i am so grateful for uh as as a fan and a reader oh, thank you jeff man it's it's just great and it's an inspiration too and i um, and I think among the things that's inspiring is the way that you've you found your voice, you know, in such a way that is unique and individual and and that doesn't conform to anybody else's notion of what a comic strip should be. In fact, you made, you know, through Tom the Dancing Bug, you, you sort of made the, the syndicate conform to you rather than the other way around and i well, think it's, yeah that's that's true and you know it was very gratifying when they came to me and said they wanted to to work with me even though my comic strip was such a weird uh a weird thing to them you know it's a large format um complicated sometimes controversial um mm -hmm. very pointed um wordy thing that's not like you know for better or for worse or uh or is ziggy um yeah. which is also in their stable um yeah right uh so uh yeah that was that was really really gratifying and you know it i've made it it's it's you know there's it's a certain um there there's been a uh, i've i've sort of suffered for it in in some cases but maybe if this is the only way i could do it but yeah i i I made my own, my sort of without compromise. This is my comic strip. I made it up. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really like anything else. Um, and, uh, you know, I've stuck with it for 34 years. Um, and, you know, it's not the most uh, marketable comic strip for, in some cases, for, you know, for some markets that ex have existed. Um, but it really found a great home uh, on, on the web with, with, uh like-minded people um mm -hmm. and i'm so grateful for that well it's kind of cool to know that there are that many people out there who find the irrelevant what was the floating head of irrelevant and inconsequential predictions or something is see, the, it's the floating head of irrelevant and wrong predictions yeah <laughs> he always shows up in a in a critical moment in a uh in, yeah. in, in an adventure and says something that that makes no sense no sense whatsoever <laughs> but i love that like there was one i was reading about some squirrel who was i don't know can't remember what the squirrel was doing but anyway it's just again the language of it it was perfectly phrased absolutely oh, yeah. thank you it, I... it was perfectly phrased they may i just again i was in the dentist's office laughing my ass off and uh you know to the chagrin of all of those nervous dental patients around me <laughs>
Man, That's great. I'm so glad. Thank you very much. Well, this has been fantastic, uh, Ruben. Um, I've really, really enjoyed our conversation today. Jeff, it was great talking with you. Yeah. yeah and it's wonderful. And I hope when you come to uh, come to, to town, uh, look me up. Oh, uh, wouldn't that be great? Yes. It would be fabulous. Come to a ball game. I would get a kick out of that. I haven't been to, I, I haven't been to a Rumble Ponies game. I've been to uh, years ago, many years ago. They were they had a different name. They were still a Mets farm team. Yes, they were the they were the Binghamton Bees. Yeah, something like that. Well, there was one even before that. Oh, really? Yeah, and I can't we, remember we, what it was. We should say that before we started, we uh, I mentioned that I I go to Binghamton every <laughs> summer uh, with a bunch of friends uh, to see. Uh, the Mets minor league team, uh, the Binghamton now Rumble Ponies. Rumble uh, Ponies. Play. I've got to ask you, what do you do? You travel around, see, you know, minor league Mets teams, or you just happen to come here? When we started, it was just Binghamton, mm -hmm. but then the Mets got a Syracuse team. Sure. So then we made we made a we made a, a dub. We now we go to Binghamton, then Syracuse. Mm -hmm. uh, so and so yeah, so we we do we do two, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's not long. We do it. We do it. We drive uh we drive sleep see the see the games and come back wow amazing and uh, um let's see are you a big mets fan then the, yes the, the yes mets, really. cra okay. crazy crazy unfortunately yeah crazy uh uh distractingly uh avid met fan but you, you know i one of the things i find in sports um it's 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 like the only place these days where i can relax is like in my own case, I'm a football fan, so I'll go to old New York Giants YouTube videos, or I'll I'll just watch all this stuff, and it takes me. It's the only thing that and collecting football cards is the only thing that oh, takes. Me nice. out of yeah, my no, head. nostalgic stuff is is nice, and that's relaxing. Hmm. But Met games, I find, is as are as stressful. As, oh yeah, as I can imagine. Last night I watched the Mets Yankee game. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't watch at certain points. I like would like <laughs> leave and do something else. I yeah. wonder what's happening. I, I can't take it anymore. It's yeah. too stressful. <laughs> and I, I impose it on myself. <laughs> oh man, I understand completely. I completely understand. Uh, I haven't followed. I, I've been terribly remiss about baseball. I haven't been following baseball for a number of years, and it's because actually, I tell you, uh, I don't have cable television. Um, when TV went digital rather than analog, we lost all of that stuff. So we yeah. just have a couple of apps that we go before. And, right. and I don't have the Yankees app. I'm a Yankees fan, so uh, I hate to tell you. Um, okay. But I don't have, and I don't have the uh, Major League Baseball app either on my TV. So, and my wife has said, you know, like, okay, we there's only so many we can do. So I, I don't have any of them, so I don't follow any of it anymore. Yeah, that well, yeah, well, they really make sure that in order to follow your local team, that you have to pay a lot of money. Oh, right. Um, they have to pay basically for something like cable. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that is like that is a huge expense. I, it used yeah. to be you could just you know I tell kids this you used to be able to just, yes you had to turn a dial but you could put up <laughs> WPIX and you could watch the Yankees and Phil Rizzuto and sure. you know all that or you could ch Channel Nine and watch Lindsey Nelson and Ralph Kiner talk Met games you know them yeah you know the the channels and the guys yeah oh, the man, old guys I sure do I so mean, that's it but now they they really they they they've got me I can't I can't not do it. Oh. And uh, and that's that's the reason I had to have a day job for so many years. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's they got me. <laughs> well, well, uh, I, 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 well, I hope the season goes better for you. Uh, Thanks. Time goes on. Anyway, uh, Ruben, it's been great, and uh, I hope you'll come back again sometime. Jeff, that would be great. Yeah, thanks very much. It was thanks for inviting me. It was really fun talking with you. Yeah, and congratulations on the book, and I hope everybody will uh, subscribe at uh into the into the hive is that what it is yeah yeah oh i should say it's uh just go to um tom the dancing bug.com okay information on everything the inner hive please please join me we'll have so much fun and the uh and for buying the books and the books yeah the book comes out very newest book volume eight um uh again the title of it escapes me it is um it's Tom, the great storm, Tom the Dancing Bug. It's the great storm. Instead of the great pumpkin, it's the great storm. Yes. Tom the Dancing Bug. A uh, lot of great stuff there. So I hope people will do that. And all this stuff will be in the show notes, folks, so you can look there. Uh, again, Ruben, wonderful. Great. My pleasure, Jeff. Yep. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye. So did you enjoy that? I hope so. 
Uh, I enjoyed talking with Ruben about Tom the Dancing Bug. And listen, if you want uh, a laugh fest, a laugh out loud fest, uh, I want you to, to head to TomTheDancingBug.com uh, or to Amazon or wherever you, you pick up your comics collections and pick up Tom the Dancing Bug, any one of the collected volumes, one through eight, uh, number eight, um, It's the Great Storm. Uh, Tom the Dancing Bug is now available on Amazon and on Tom the Dancing Bug. Subscribe to the Inner Hive as well. Believe me, take my recommendation. It's a gr- it's it's money well invested. Uh, the books are beautiful. Uh, they don't date. Uh, I've been reading uh, Volume Seven currently, uh, which is Into the Trump Verse, and it's just it's still as current as as though those things were happening now. It brings it all back. Um, but it also applies. And then Ruben's humor just goes, you know, is, is timeless. Uh, his absurd sense of things is timeless and uh, super fun pack comics, man. I just can't stop laughing. Anyway, it's great stuff. You're going to love it. Uh, go to Amazon. Pick up the new book. Pick up the old books. Tom the Dancing Bug, okay? Uh, I cannot recommend it enough. Love it. Love that comic strip. Just love it. And I look forward to every single episode. And I hope, I hope you will subscribe as well. Uh, having said that, um, w- w- so, you know, um, uh, let's see, I'm getting, what am I doing now? Uh, it's summertime. I'm, I'm working on uh, the Dacry Jones book. Uh, it is a tabloid newspaper. It, it is uh, 20 pages. It's full color. And it is, every page is like a, a Sunday, an installment of a Sunday comic strip, right? So each page reads, reach it, reads as though it were, a, you know, a weekly installment from a comic strip. And it, it tells an adventure story. It's got, uh, it takes a pretty silly ad- approach to things because that's me. Uh, it's hard for me to take myself too seriously. And uh, I th- it's, a, it's, just, it's a lot of fun. I'm telling you, it's a lot of fun. It's very colorful and very pretty. So uh, I encourage you, you can make a late pledge, by the way, at DaiquiriJones.com. If you go there now, you can still get the printed and the PDF versions of this brand new comic that's going to be coming out in early September. So I, I hope you will, you will do so because I want to get this in as, the hands of as many people as possible. Because why? Just because, just because. I'm not out to make some money. I'm out to get the work to people because... I like um, making stuff, and, uh, and uh, I think I've made something that will entertain you, if not in, enlighten you, and I, I hope, I just want you to enjoy it, and, uh, and so it's about getting the work out, and I'm doing Cartoons Crossroads Columbus in September, I'm doing a local comic show, which the second local show in a, in, in a few months, we did one in early July, which was a lot of fun, sponsored by Fat Cat Comics in Johnson City, New York, my local comic shop. They did one, first comic convention here in Binghamton in a long, long, long time, I think maybe forever, really. And now there's a second one coming in early September, just before Cartoons Crossroads Columbus. And I'm looking forward to that. And so this book is going to be available there. So if you're local, you'll be able to pick it up at, at that show uh, coming up soon. Uh, in I think it's September 15th and 16th. And if you're local, again, follow Fat Cat Comics on Facebook and you'll keep up with the news there. And I'll let you know more about that but if you're not local um see me in in columbus ohio okay uh i'm hoping to make some friends meet some some new people introduce the work to people and uh, hopefully it'll be the beginning of uh, more convention stuff uh for me and, and some of my work going forward i hope so anyway uh that's it for now uh follow me on green on instagram at green screen comic uh you can also follow me on facebook i'm there um, and what, what else? Uh, and I'm, I'm here and, oh golly, gee, if you want to help the show, which it would be a great help because I keep, I have to keep buying comics to, you know, uh, inform myself about my guests and stay current with them. So, uh, and there's more expenses than that for the show. So, um, patreon.com slash Jeff Grogan, join us on Patreon. It's a lot of fun. I'm going to be making sure that early episodes, early access to these episodes, without all of the falderall of me talking and ads and all that stuff, goes up onto Patreon. So patreon.com slash Jeff Grogan for early access to this show and just to, you know, keep the show going, keep it all afloat. Uh, Join us there. It's going to be a lot of fun. And um, there was something else I wanted to tell you. 
You can pick up copies of all my work, all my works available at Etsy, etsy.com slash comics print works. You can get all of my stuff. You can get prints there. You can also get, uh, and they're beautiful G. Clay prints, but you can also get my comics there. And I've just had a brand new batch in preparation for cons coming up this year. Brand new batch of, of print runs done of green screen. Uh, I've got Thackeray Jones. I've got, um, uh, what is it? What the heck was it called now? Cheeseburger, Donut and the Cheeseburger. I've got that too. So you can go there and pick up all my work. So, you know, if you're curious, definitely do that. Uh, finally, oh my gosh, uh, I'm going to start doing live streams on YouTube. My YouTube channel is Jeff Grogan's Blockhead, so go there, subscribe. I'm going to be um, talking about some of the comics I've picked up recently, I'm talking about some of my work, talking to some interesting creators. I'm going to be starting that sometime in August, so be looking for that. Go to YouTube and and subscribe to Jeff Grogan's Blockhead, okay? This show ends up there, too, uh, another audio version of it, so you can always you know find it there as well. But I'm going to start doing live streams, okay? So um, look for it there, all right? Uh, and, and by the way, I was on Andy Smith's show. Oh, my gosh, I've been so busy uh, not long ago. So Andy Smith uh, on YouTube, look for, uh, I can't remember, it's Andy Smith Artist, I think. Um, I did a show in the middle of July, July 17th or something like that. So um, look for it because we had an interesting conversation. If you were a fan of Silver Age comics art, particularly Gil Kane, we had a Gil Kane love fest, <laughs> uh, Andy and I, because we're both big fans of the great Gil Kane. So uh, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. And he shows a really interesting uh, portfolio of Gil Kane's work, uh, his pencil, pre preliminary pencils, uh, sketches for an issue of Green Lantern. Fantastic stuff, man. Just fantastic. Anyway, so head on over to that, but uh, make sure you subscribe, okay, to Jeff Grogan's Blockhead. Go to patreon.com slash Jeff Grogan. Go to etsy.com slash shop slash comics print works. Go to green screen comic on Instagram at Green Screen Comic. Go everywhere. Follow me everywhere. Check out with me. Check me out at uh, Cartoon Crossroads Columbus and all of that stuff. And I will see you. I'll be happy to shake your hand, sign your comics, and say hello. It'd be great to hear from from those of you who listen to the show. Okay? Uh, wow. Okay, that'll do it for now. Remember TomTheDancingBug.com and also Amazon for more Tom the Dancing Bug. And uh, I will talk to you soon. I'll be back soon, hopefully with another guest quicker this time. And uh, anyway, I hope you are happy, healthy, wealthy, and well. And I hope your summer has just been a joyous one. And uh, geez, it's it's great to bring more stuff to you. And uh, I hope hope you enjoy it. And I hope to, to hear from you, see from you, and uh all of that stuff. And as always, folks, thanks for listening. Bye for now. <laughs>